Do you appreciate the plain brown wrapper I put on this one? I'm going to talk a bit about spider genomics and although I was tempted to title it with a garish, garish detailed photomicrograph of a spider, there are a lot of people who have severe arachnophobia and freak out at the sight of a spider. And it's reasonable they'd rather not see such a thing, so I thought I wouldn't splat it up on the main page of my channel. Um, and that's actually kind of interesting. I occasionally see suggestions that there are genes that promote a specific fear of multi-legged organisms, which unfortunately I never find very credible. It seems to me that a more likely explanation is that we build models of our world that tend to focus on ourselves and our conspecifics, and that there's a range of, of, of experiences that build those models and possibly genetic factors that amplify our sensitivity to differences. But that's not what I want to talk about here. I'm going to give you a brief summary of a recent paper on house spider genomics. And now, trigger warning, big trigger warning, I'm going to show you a picture of a beautiful spider. So arachnophobics, abort, abort, abort. Time for you to get out now. I fell in love with spiders decades ago when I took a graduate level course in sensory physiology and the instructor took the interesting approach of focusing the entire course on spiders. There's a lot of opportunity there. See all those hairs on the spider? Those aren't like our familiar mammalian hairs which are made up of stacks of dead cells. These hairs are all sensory processes. Uh, they're filled with nerves and they're just sitting there quivering in responsiveness. You see all those eyes? They have amazing camera eyes, just like ours, not compound eyes. Uh, they just have more of them than we do, and they have acute resolution. I can't help but see this gorgeous animal as standing there poised and responsive to a flood of sensory information, tuned to every scent, every little breeze, every vibration, every flicker of motion. And then when you watch them move, it's like they're dancing. So how can you not love them? But the paper I'm talking about today isn't this fabulous kind of spider. It's about the more mundane, common house spider. I'm going to try and pronounce this. We'll see if I can succeed. This is Parasteatoda tepidariorum. Oh, man, that's a mouthful. Anyway, it's the common house spider. Uh, you've probably got a few of them lurking in corners of your house. They've also become a model organism in developmental biology and genomics of growing importance. And this work by Schweger and others reports in the, on the analysis, analysis of the genomic sequence of this spider and also of a representative scorpion. Why a scorpion? That's what's interesting. It's using an analysis of the genome to understand the phylogeny of the arthropods. So let's take a look at that. Just to give you the big picture, here's a cladogram of the arthropods. There are some larger categories to know. The mandibulata at the bottom of the image are the insects and myriapods. They're named for their jaws or mandibles. The chelicerates, the top two thirds of the diagram, are also named for their mouth parts. They have a pair of jointed chelicerae or claw horns in front of their mouth and a pair of structures called pedipalps just behind their mouth. The chelicerates also include horseshoe crabs and ticks and mites. A subgroup of the chelicerates are the spiders and scorpions called the arachnopulmonata, which are characterized by the possession of book lungs. This study finds another characteristic which unites spiders and scorpions. They both have an unusually large number of genes on the order of 28,000 to 30,000. To put that in perspective, humans have about 20,000 genes. So apparently, if the intelligent design creations have their way, you're going to have to surrender your tiara of complexity to a new queen, that little spider down in one corner of your basement. How did they get so many more genes? The evidence suggests their lineages had a whole genome duplication event about 430 billion years ago. That is, the ancestor of all scorpions and spiders was a polyploid arthropod deep in the Silurian. So I'm going to explain just a little bit about gene duplications next. There are a couple of ways genes get duplicated. One way is by tandem duplication. That is, 
a small chunk of a chromosome gets copied. That's illustrated in the top diagram. You have an array of four genes, A, B, C, and D, and an error occurs during replication or meiosis, and in this example, an extra copy of B is produced. So we've got A, then B, then B prime, then C, then D. This happens all the time. It's how you end up with gene families or collections of mostly similar genes. The classic example is our beta globin gene, a region on chromosome 11 that has five different globin genes, beta, delta, gamma A, gamma G, and epsilon globin. They're all related, they're all very similar, but they have subtly different functions. Another way you can get more genes is by whole genome duplication. This can happen by a failure of cytokinesis and mitosis or meiosis, or polyspermy, or by both. The organism ends up with twice as many chromosomes and twice as many copies of each gene. So we go from the state where you have A, B, C, and D on one chromosome to one where we have two chromosomes, each with an A, B, C, and D gene. There are some lineages that are quite tolerant of this kind of duplication. Some amphibians and plants are readily polyploid. Uh, just stroll through our grocery and look at the brassica plants, which has many variants that differ in their ploidy. Other lineages can't cope with a change in dosage. Humans, for instance, are spontaneously aborted if polyploid. One thing about these duplications, both kinds, is that they're often redundant. They produce a surplus copy of one gene. So if a mutation occurs to knock one copy out, there's no selection against that mutation. So these often decay quite rapidly, as seen in this example here. So some of the copies will accumulate mutations that destroy their function, so they're reduced to being pseudogenes and no longer contribute to the phenotype, like C and B in this diagram. As long as they are exact duplicates, there is no major selection pressure to retain both copies. So how can they persist? If they acquire mutations that change the properties of one of the copies in a useful way. This is called neo-functionalization and it's to be expected of duplicated genes that persist for 430 million years. So here's the questions we are asking. Are the increases in gene numbers in scorpions and spiders due to tandem duplication or whole genome duplication? Also, did this duplication occur in the last common ancestor of spiders and scorpions? or did they occur independently in the two lineages? And finally, do we see evidence of neo-functionalization of the duplicated genes? So we're gonna look at the Hox genes in these animals. Uh, these are the Hox gene clusters of PTEP, that's short for the spider, CSCU, which is the scorpion, and ISCA, an outgroup, this is the tick. So ticks only have one hox, cluster, hox cluster, um, but the spiders and the scorpions have two each, cluster A and cluster B. They all contain the canonical 10 hox genes of the standard arthropod array, and the sequence information says these are all parologous genes. If you look closely at the diagram, you may notice that the dark line linking the genes in each array is sometimes broken in places. That's because the modern spiders and scorpions have lost some of the collinearity that was probably present in their distant ancestors. That's not too unusual. Drosophila also has a break in their hox array. It just tells us that some novel regulatory mechanisms have evolved that make the structure less dependent on simple spatial order. Another interesting feature is that in the typical hox sequence, the spatial order from left to right is also the temporal order from early expression to late expression. This is not entirely true in the spider, again telling us that Hox gene expression has evolved in new ways. Look at the structure of the gene clusters though, it's also clear that these are the products of whole genome duplication. Tandem duplication would replicate the array piecemeal. A whole genome duplication would carry along the genes and all the DNA between them with a greater degree of intactness. Detailed analysis, analysis of the entirety of the array reveals that yes, in both spiders and scorpions, there was a whole genome duplication. 
Furthermore, spiders and scorpions share those details, which tells us that this was a duplication that occurred in the last common ancestor. One additional question would be nice to answer is whether the duplication contributed to the success and the morphological traits of the arachnopulmonata. And we don't have an answer to that one, sorry. I did ask one other question, and that is, do we see any neo-functionalization? To answer that, we need to look at gene expression in spider embryos, since that is where these Hox genes are expressed. So let's look at the time series of development of a spider. Spider embryos are so cool looking. Okay, I think I've got to try raising some of these in my lab. Uh, anyway, just focus on one little bit of this embryonic morphology. Look at stage 20 right there. We can see some of the overall organization of a spider. Uh, OP is short for opisthosoma, a fancy word for the spider's abdomen. Pro is short for prosoma, the front part or cephalothorax of the spider. You can see four darkly stained legs dangling down and in front a bit of the chelicerae. The Hox genes, as you may recall, are expressed in specific parts of the body plan and define segment identity. So the next question is to ask, where in this morphology are the individual Hox genes expressed? And I'm going to show you that in a somewhat complicated figure. Okay, but it's not too bad. First of all, look across the top and you see those little short abbreviations there. Uh, CH is chelicerae. PP is pedipalps, L1 through 4 are the limbs, and O1 through O through O12 are the segments of the abdomen. The different Hox genes are then listed on the vertical axis. And the colored bars show the extent of the different of expression of each gene. Uh, darker colors are expressed earlier than lighter colors. So we're seeing a little bit of timing data here as well. For example, then, uh, labial B is first switched on in the pedipalp segment at embryonic stage 4. That's what the number on the bar means. And labial A is turned on in the same segment a little later at embryonic stage 6. La labial B later expands to be expressed in the first two limb segments, L1 and L2, while a labial A expands further and is expressed in all of the labial segment or the limb segments. Uh, L1 through L4. So if you just look at this array, what you can see is that no two Hox genes have exactly the same timing or expression domain, which is exactly what we'd expect if neofunctionalization had taken place. It's also completely unsurprising, but nice to see. Also of note, I think you can detect in this diagram that there's one group of Hox genes primarily associated with the prosoma, labial to fits, that's short for Fushi Terotsu. And there's another group primarily associated with the opisthosoma, Antenopedia to abdominal B. So we've got a nice functional distinction that re reflects the morphology of the spider. Okay, so that's all for now. Um, I'll just re leave you with our pretty spider once again. And I'll tell you, you know where to find me on freethoughtblogs.com. I'm talking about a paper by Schweiger listed up there. Uh, I also, another good paper to look at is this one by Hilbrandt, which is an, a general overview of the utility of the spider in developmental biology. So it's a good one to look up. Anyway, you know where to find me. I'm on freethoughtblogs.com slash pharyngula. You can get me through my email or you can leave a comment here and ask any questions. I will try to answer them. But I want to leave you with one last image. This is a scanning EM of the house spider embryo. Isn't that pretty? It's kind of Cthulhu-esque. I want one. Thanks.